Hello, MCC family and friends. Today we will be reading God's word as given through his servant, James. We will be reading in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. While you're turning there, I would like to introduce myself. I am Bryn Zebrak, and I've had the privilege of being a member here at MCC for many years now. And today, we will be together reminded that God's word and his wisdom is forever to be applied to our lives and is timeless. James 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. The word of God for the people of God. Hey, MCC, and wherever you're watching, we're in James. We're going through this manual for maturity. Today, we're looking at solving problems for today. James has moved really towards relationships. He said we need wisdom in our relationships. Now he said we need to know how to deal with conflict in relationships. I read about a woman named Mildred. She had uh, fallen on the floor. They came to her house, said she's cold, and they think she's dead. They don't think she's breathing. They actually put her in a body bag, took her to the morgue, and she was at the morgue for 90 minutes before the bag started moving. A person saw it and jumped out of his skin, he said. So they rescued her and got her out. They had buried her alive. There's cases of all kinds of people, unfortunately, through the years being buried alive. But James reminds us, you can bury someone alive with the 10,000 digs that we give each other in our fights, our conflicts. Literally, we can bury their heart, their psyche, their attitude towards God, towards the other people. He's reminding the people, again, about speech, relationships, and life. He says, this is very important. He says, the main thing here is that conflict is caused when I want what I want. And when two people are at conflict, Somebody wants what they want over what God wants, or both people are wanting what they want over what God wants. That's his main uh, idea from all of this. Now, James, again, is talking about righteous desires that go to runaway desires, desires that we let run away with us, that we crave. He calls them cravings, passions, that we want what we want at any expense. So he's going to talk about the cause of conflict and then the cure of conflict. And he's going to let us know that the cause is always at the root, not the fruit. If there's certain fruit in your relationship of hurt, yelling, pain, harsh words, there's a root to it. And he wants to get to the root. He's like his half brother. Jesus said, you've got to get to the root of everything, the heart of everything. So here's the first one. He says, there's a desire to possess. He said, one of the desires that takes hold of us is to have stuff, to possess things that we think they're going to make us happy. He says in verse one on your screen, what causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war inside you? He said, the biggest problem is not someone else. It's not circumstances. It's not society. It's not what's going on politically or what's going on around us. It's in our heart. He said it's a war inside 
And Apostle Paul said the same thing. Remember, he said in Romans chapter 7, he said right now, whatever he was going through, right now, he said, I'm a wretched man. It means miserable, horrible. He said, I feel horrible. He said, I do some things I don't want to do, and the things I really need to be doing, I'm not doing. I'm saying some things I really don't want to say, some things I wish I'd said I didn't say. He said, right now, there's a war going on inside me. You know, that's a good reminder. As No matter how mature you are, how close you are to Christ, every day can be a war if we don't yield our life to Christ. He said, our passions can get a hold of us. Verse 2, he said, we desire, it means to crave, yearn, long for, and we don't have, so we murder, we covet, because we can't obtain, and we fight and we quarrel. Look at that, murdering, coveting, fighting, quarrel, just because we don't get what we want. It's like a runaway train. These runaway desires, if we feed them, play on them, chew on them, fantasize about them, we start pushing our rights. We start running over people like a runaway train. That word uh, covet is kamad in the Hebrew. It means an intense, ongoing craving. It's been fed like a fire has been fed by oxygen and by uh, 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 wood that's put on the fuel and maybe a little gasoline. That's the idea here. It's been fed. We've been fantasizing about it or focusing on it or replaying. It's an intense, ongoing desire to get what we want, obtain. The word means to get, to own, to have it, to possess it. We want something so bad, we've focused on it and we're going after it, even at the cost of other people. You know, in America, the last 50 years, our square footage has almost doubled. We have now enough storage places, storage units, to match one for every 11 people in America. But at the same time, our families have gotten smaller. And as we've taken surveys in America, the number one thing that we see is the angst, the anxiety that something is missing. Something's missing. We've got, we became a prosperous nation, but our souls have been shriveling. That's what James is talking about. He, call, he would call it today, if he were here, the law of diminishing returns. We think something's going to make us happy, but it doesn't. You have to have more of it. You have to have a stronger drink, a stronger thing, a bigger car, a bigger house, if that's what's going to make you happy. He says, it won't work. Now, if you got a Bible with cross-references, you got some Bible verses right there. It might be some of these, like 1 Timothy 6.17 on your screen. God made everything for our enjoyment. Would you just say that at home right now? Think of that. God made everything for enjoyment. Everything. Satan can't make anything for our enjoyment. Everything God made is for our pleasure because we most glorify God when we're most satisfied in him, when we're thankful for it, when we appreciate it, when we use it properly. So here's, the, here's what we want to focus on. He says, it's not what we own. It's what owns us. It's what owns us. God gave it to us to enjoy as a steward, not to be an owner of it. Everybody, everybody knows that one day we'll give it all up. It'll all end up in the trash heap. It'll all burn up when the world burns up. He said, in the meantime, enjoy it. But he said, you don't own it. We don't own anything that's here. There's a monastery that when they let people come in to pray and, and come and visit, they say to them, hey, if you need anything, let us know. Now, we say that phrase when somebody comes to our house, when somebody stays. I like to say that and and offer them uh, food or tell them where the, the cleaning materials are or the bath towels, whatever. Uh, but I don't say the next phrase. They say at the monastery, they say, if you tell us what you need, we'll teach you how to live without it. But what a good phrase. They say, why are you here? If you need anything, tell us, and we'll teach you how to live without it. That's what James is saying. Don't, don't get so wrapped up about the things, the stuff in this world. In Hebrews 10, 34, he says to this group of people, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. They, they had people come in and put some of them in prison in this context and, and hurt some of them. And some of them, they took their property just because they're followers of Christ. But he said, you joyfully let it go since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession, a lasting one, an abiding one. There's that word possession. You had a better possession, so you let some things go. Now, it's hard, isn't it, to rejoice when somebody blocks our goals, these are real people. They had a real field. They had a real cow. They had real sheep. 
They had real houses. And somebody came in and took them, all because they were just followers of Christ, just following the Lord. They had goals in life. They had kids. They had plans. And somebody interrupted them. It's so hard to rejoice when somebody gets in our way and blocks our goals for life. That's what he's talking about. And that's what happens in relationships. Somebody blocks our goals, takes things away, doesn't give us what we think. And it gets, it gets so heated so quickly. He said, you gave them up because, listen, he said, you had a better possession. Not just a possession. You had a better possession. There's a joke in my family. When we go to the beach or go to the lake, I wear $1, $5 sunglasses. I've lost them all over the world. I mean, literally. I've lost them just about everywhere you could go. We talk about sharks and fish swimming around with my sunglasses, but they're only $1, $5 glasses because my good sunglasses, they're at home or they're in the car. I got a better possession somewhere else. So I just say, oh, well, I'll get another pair. That's harder to do when it's a cow, sheep, house, right, field. But compared to heaven, he said, you let it go because you knew you had a better possession. The word know here means to recognize, to understand. They recognize the difference between heaven and the difference between things on this earth. We get things, we enjoy them, we get them from God, but we don't get to keep them. They gave them up willingly. In other words, they were gladder that they had it than madder than they lost it. But if you follow this through, you get to Hebrews 13, he reminds them that they get to challenged here. And they say, he says, it's not on your screen, but he says, hey, don't love money, be content with what you have. Don't love money. Be content with what you have. He says, don't go back to thinking that things will make you happy. Satan so wants to make us discontent. He gets us wrapped up in things. We get so discontent with the turnout because they can't do it. You remember the movie Schindler's List? Oscar Schindler comes out and and he says, "Uh, I could have bought one more. He had been buying Jews to save them from death from the concentration camp. And he'd been working them in his factory. And he was using his own money and selling things to buy these people to save their lives. Today, there's about uh, 10,000 people that that came from those Jews that he saved. Think about that all through these years. And he comes out at the end of the movie and he says, I could have bought one more as he looks at stuff. Watch this video. It's a good reminder of why we have stuff. Good. What about this car? Why did I keep the car? Ten people right there. Ten people. Ten more people. This pin. Two people. This is gold. Two more people. You would have given me two for At least one. You would have given me one, one more. One more person. A person is there. For this. I could have got one more person. And I didn't. And I, I didn't. Isn't that powerful? You see his expressions. You see the pain of what he compared, of what he had versus a better possession, of what he could have done with his stuff. You know, Jesus spoke about this in Luke 16 on your screen. He said, use your worldly resources to benefit others, to make friends. And when your possessions, there's that word, when your possessions are gone, he said, I guarantee you they will be gone one day. They will either be gone because you sent them ahead in heaven or they'll be gone because you die or somebody takes them away from you. One way or another, they're going to be gone. He said, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. Your friends and your possessions you sent ahead will welcome you into eternity. He said, use your stuff, your house, your car, your things. Use our stuff to not only enjoy, but make friends for heaven. Can I remind you of something? You only get to keep what you send ahead. You only get to keep what you send ahead. Send it ahead. Give somebody something today. Give somebody some of the best china or a gift 
or take somebody out to eat or have somebody in your home if you can. Give some today, the best stuff today. Number two, he says, the desire to feel pleasure gets a hold of some of us sometimes and it's really strong. And he means to feel pleasure at the expense of God, at the expense of other people. Now we think of sexual pleasure and certainly a lot of people are misusing people sexually. But James means any kind of pleasure that goes against what God's plan is. Again, it starts out as a righteous desire oftentimes and goes to a runaway desire. He said the desire to feel pleasure at the expense of obeying God. Verse 3, he said we ask and don't receive because we ask wrongly to spend it on our own passions. There it is. To spend it on our own cravings. We want to feel good at any expense. Self-medicating. That's, that's really what it is. It says, I want to feel pleasure and I don't want to feel pain. And I'm not going to run to God. So I'll run to alcohol or work or a woman or a man or stuff or a thing, whatever it might be. Tim Allen, the actor, he said, I self-medicated for years. You know, he'd went to prison. He got in trouble in different ways. And he said, I, I self-medicated because I didn't want to fail. But then he said, I began to realize I was self-medicating because I didn't want to succeed. He said, either way, I was afraid. I was afraid of what it would cost me. I was afraid of certain things that would happen. And he said, I self-medicated on both sides. And he said, the problem with life is sometimes it's so daily. It's so ordinary. We go to bed, we get back up, we got things to do. And he said, just to feel a little comfort and just to feel good in a little bit of time, he said, I began to self-medicate and it, and it cost me a lot. It cost me a great deal. That's what James is talking about. Sean McDowell, Josh McDowell's son, said he asked a group of college students, if you were going to die in three days, what would you want to do? He said most of them said have sex. Some of them said party. Some of them told places they want to go. Some of them things they wanted to buy, rock climb, buy a fancy car, whatever. So he asked them. He said, is there anything you think you could do on this earth that you, if you didn't do it, you'd regret if you went to in eternity, he said, is there anything you'd think you'd miss out on if you went to heaven? He said, to his astonishment, everybody but two students said yes. They thought there were things better here than in heaven. I think we've done a bad job saying what heaven's like. They, he, said, I, he said he was not only stunned, but he said he realized he had to present God and eternity better than what he'd been doing. You know, the desire to feel pleasure at any cost has shipwrecked a lot of people maybe shipwrecked you, but you don't have to stay there. I just want to pause on this message. You don't have to stay where you are. Come back to God. Come and tell him where you are. Tell him what you need. Tell him you want him to be your great pleasure of life, your great treasure. He'll receive you wherever you are. Put your faith in Christ, that he died for you, raised again, that he can do what he promises to do. Third, there's the desire to be prideful. We have this intense desire to say, I got this. I'm in control. I can handle this. It shows up in our prayer life. Pride always shows up in our prayer life. Verse 2, you don't have because you don't ask. So that's prayerlessness. There's times where we just don't pray. We say, I got this. But notice verse 3, you ask and you don't receive because you want to spend it on your passions. We pray selfishly. We pray selfish, shallow prayers because we really just want what we want. We don't want to expand the kingdom. We just want to be comfortable or we want to get out of trouble. And he's, he, this is beyond relevant. You know, people ask, is the Bible relevant? Listen, this is beyond relevant. This is, this is where all of us live at times. Even though it's 2,000 years ago, this is so real. As a follower of Christ, I can become prayerless or I can pray selfish prayers because really I'm just wanting to go about my life and do my thing. Now, what's going on? In a believer's life, a follower of Christ, if he or she starts praying this way or not praying, there's some kind of thought inside that says, I can handle this. I don't need to depend on God because prayer is dependence on God. Yeah, I don't need to depend on him. Maybe he'll take the big stuff, but I'll take these things. Hey, there's no little things or big things with God. So he says, that's such a bad place to be. Ego, that means edging God out. It just says, I got this. James says, bad place. Now I want to remind you, it's natural to want to be autonomous, to want to be independent, to worry, to go at it like crazy, to try. All those things are natural. They're just not supernatural. 
The Christian life is not a natural life. It's a supernatural life with Christ living inside of you. All of those things are natural. They're just not supernatural. Now, take it to a relationship. What's going on if you're a couple or if you're at odds with a friend and there's conflict? What's going on with your prayer life in that? There's got to be something going on, he says. He says, are you really praying together? Are you really praying about how to be a witness? Are you praying about how to yield your rights and humble yourself? He said, not if it keeps on going. And here's the guarantee of what's going to happen. Here's the guarantee if there's conflict and no prayer, no humility. Look on your screen, Proverbs 13, 10. Would you say this with me at home? If you're at home, arrogance leads to nothing but strife. It's just a matter of time. Prideful arrogance leads to conflict. Here's the other one. Say it with me. Ready? Pride brings disgrace. It's just a matter of time. He said, pride brings humiliation. I've experienced both of those too many times. I, I, I got this, and then conflict comes. I got this, and then humiliation comes. I get, I get exposed for being far less than I acted like I was or thought I was. He said, it's just a matter of time. That's a toxin. That's a toxin you don't want in your relationships, James says. The puffer fish, it has enough toxin to kill 30 people. But the problem with it, there's no good antidote. There's no good antidote. At least there's an antidote for pride. He's going to tell us it's humility. We're going to get there in a moment. It's humility. But I just want to pause and say, here's the desires. He says it can be dangerous. The desire to possess something that you really can't possess the desire to get pleasure at any cost at the expense of God or other people and eventually at the expense of yourself and the desire to be prideful and say, I got this. So here's the cure on your screen. The cure for these kind of foolish, ungodly arguments is humility. What's humility? It's confidence in God. He said, the cure is confidence in God, not yourself. Verse 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He stands up and stands against the proud, especially those who carry his name. What a scene, what an image that God would get up and oppose his own people. It's a good thing eventually that he disciplines us, but what a sight that God has to get up and deal with his own people and oppose us and stand against us. In verse 10, he uses the same word, Become, be confident in God. That's how we could say it. Be confident in God, not yourselves, before the Lord, and he will exalt you. He'll give you grace. He'll lift you up in due time. Some of our problem is we want something now. We want it now. We don't want to wait. We don't want to be patient. He says, I'll exalt you in due time. Many of you know, we, we, call, we named our daughters Jacqueline and Jordan. Jacqueline's the youngest. Jacqueline means God is gracious. So we told her over and over, and over God will give you grace. Jordan is from the Jordan River. It means to descend. You descend into greatness. You don't climb to greatness. Jesus said, whoever's the servant of all will be the greatest of all. So God is gracious and descend into greatness. We reminded them over and over. We didn't do it as well as we could. And, 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 and it took a while for it to catch on. But, you know, a name means something. It means something. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're called a Christian. It means a Christ-like one, a follower of Christ Jesus, a follower of the one who raised from the dead. He says, if that's the case, God will give you grace. God will give you grace. Just humble yourself before him. What are the marks of humility? James goes right into them. He says the first one is submitting to God. He said submit to God as a way of life. Yield your life to God. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Hey, can I remind you of something we talk about on a regular basis? Every day there needs to be a funeral. Every day there needs to be a funeral. Jesus said die to yourself daily. And every day there needs to be a resurrection. So my prayers I've shared before is, Lord, today I give you my life. I want to die to myself. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray, it, I pray it constantly in the morning. I pray it almost every morning that I get up. If I forget, I usually get in trouble pretty quickly. Lord, here's my life. When I go to the shower, I change my clothes. It's a reminder to me constantly. Here's my, here's my thought life. 
I want to wear the helmet of salvation. Here's my chest. I want to have the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, here's my belt I'm putting on. I want to wear the belt of truth today. Here's my shoes. I want to wear the gospel of peace. I want to stand in your peace and give peace to others. I want to take up the sword of the Spirit. In conversations, I want to bring up your word so that you can pierce and move through foolishness and ungodliness and unkindness. Every day just about. That's my prayer. I wish I could say I fully die to myself. I'm fully all that I need to be in Christ. I'm not. But I know I need to be. I know I need to have a funeral every day of my life. Because if not, it's just too easy for me to exalt myself over people. To run roughshod. To say something I shouldn't. Everybody's got that issue. So we give out a, called, a thing called the prayer of surrender. And we're going to give it out again this week, and we send it to you at home. That prayer of surrender is a good reminder. You just see the reminder on your screen. It's a good reminder to pray and surrender yourself daily to the Lord. I read this sometimes several times a day. I keep it in my Bible as a bookmark. It starts out with this, Loving Father, I trust all my life to you. Be in control of my life. Here's my life. Loving Father, you love me. You gave your son for me. I'm going to give you my life. Here it is. And it says, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I trust you as my Lord and Savior. Your life, your death, your resurrection, they're my only hope. Lord Jesus, thank you for living for me, dying for me, and raising from the dead. Holy Spirit, that's the third person of the Trinity that lives inside of us, that empowers us to live the Christian life, to go from a natural life to a supernatural life. Holy Spirit, fill me with your presence. Give me the desire to die to myself and live the resurrected life of Christ. I want to have a funeral. I want to die to myself, exalting myself, putting myself first. I want to live for Christ. This is, uh, goes on. There's more here. But that's a good way to pray during the day, start your day. One of the things that I've learned is it's real important for me personally to at times just kneel before the Lord. You know, our body posture shows our heart posture. So I'm going to kneel down. So I just want to give you a second. If you want to kneel down at, at home, I, I just ask you to consider it. Just think about when's the last time you knelt down before God and said, here I am, I humble myself. The number one word for worship in Hebrew is to kneel down before God, to bow down, to submit yourself to God. That's what verse 7 said, submit yourself to God. So I'm going to kneel down. You can kneel down at home if you want. I'm going to kneel down and I just ask you to consider to do that right now or after this message, to kneel down and say, here I am. I give you everything. I give you my life. To ask, uh, to ask your children, your spouse, a friend to kneel down with you on a regular basis and pray is one of the most powerful things you ever do in your home. It's a message. It's a message to everybody. I I'm not here to live for myself and exalt myself. I'm yielding my life to God. I hope your kids get to see you on a regular basis on your knees, kneeling, yielding, and praying. Again, there's nothing magical about it. But the physical life often shows, the physical posture often shows the heart posture. Would you pause for a second and just pray, just a simple prayer. Lord, I submit myself to you my whole life. Everything's yours. Do with me what you want. Just pray that prayer. Watch what he'll do. Watch what he'll do in your family and in your workplace, in your school. Just say, Lord, I, I'm yours. I'm here to serve you. Do with me whatever, whatever you want. James was called camel knees. They called him camel knees because he prayed so much he had calluses on his knees. I hope that's true about us. You know, that'd be a good name. You see somebody say, hey, camel knees. That'd be a good reminder. Hey, how's your prayer life? Or if you see him praying... You know, James didn't care to be called that. It meant I'm dependent on God. I'm, I'm going to submit my life to God. Number two, we stand up to Satan. We yield our life to God. We kneel down, but we stand up to Satan. It means that we have full authority in Christ Jesus as his son, as his daughter, to stand up to what we hear that Satan speaks to us. Verse 7 again, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. Oppose him. It means to stand up against him and he will flee from you. To be real clear, James says every conflict you've ever had relationally is because something in your heart or something in the other person's heart 
and Satan is behind it, he's feeding the fire of it. He's fueling it. You need to put yourself first. You need to claim your rights. You need to say this no matter what. No matter what. You need to do this. He's fueling it. It's my heart, his fuel. First Chronicles 21.1. Same word. Listen, Satan stood up against Israel and he moved David to count all of Israel, to number them. God had told David, you don't have to count and see how many people they are. A few people with me, I'll take over your, all, all your enemies. Matter of fact, I don't need any of you. He said, you don't need a big army. And the whispers kept coming to him. Your, the enemies are growing bigger. Their armies are growing bigger. And so he took a census and he counted everybody after God told him not to. Well, the text says Satan enticed him. He persuaded him. David did it. Satan persuaded him. But notice, Satan stood up and opposed David. Now, this is a good reminder. If I'm not running head on into Satan on a regular basis, that means I'm probably going the same direction he's going. So one of the things that can encourage you today, if you're having some trouble and some doubts and some attacks, you're probably running into the one that hates your soul. If you don't hit him head on, you're going the same direction he's going. David hit him head on. He just gave up. He just, he just trusted himself. This is a reminder. I'm to stand up to Satan because he stands up against me. That'll sound something like this. Lord, I reject these thoughts. Replace my thoughts. Lord, she's not mine. Are you to gave her to me? I trust you with what you've gave me. Lord, I don't know why you have me single right now, but I'm not going to listen to these thoughts and these suggestions. I'm going to trust you. Lord, I, I don't know why I didn't get that job or why I have to leave it, but I'm not going to listen to this about being angry or bitter about this person. I refuse to think this way. I'm going to rejoice in you. You, know, you got to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. He says, every thought. Here's the thing about Satan. He'll say what you want to hear. He watches us. He says what we want to hear. And then he attacks us for listening. That's where the guilt, the shame, the feeling foolish, the feeling unworthy comes in. He tells us what we want to hear. Then he attacks us for listening. How are you doing in resisting Satan? Do you believe in your authority that Christ gave you to live in the truth? Oh, I hope so. James is saying, James is saying let's do it. And then third, he says humility means we seek God. We're seeking God. We, we submit to God. We stand up against the devil and we seek God's face. In verse 4, he, it's not on your screen, but he said, if, if I'm walking a double life, I'm committing adultery. What a strong word. I'm committing spiritual adultery. And then he says, and I have a friendship with the world. He said, I, I've got the wrong kind of friendships. I get the wrong kind of friendships. And then he says, and I'm becoming an enemy of God. I'm opposing what God wants to do in my life and in the world. Adultery, wrong kind of friendships, opposing God and his mission. He said, that's where we get when we listen to foolishness and lies. This is a serious deal. Adultery is serious. Opposing God is serious. Being foolish like this, is James, is, James, he's experienced it. He's done it. He says, this is serious stuff, and the wrong kind of friendships is serious. What's our hope? Well, if you got your Bible, you'll see it in verse 5. He said, God is jealous over you. That's your only hope. God is passionate over you. If you're his and you're drifting, he's still passionate over you. He yearns for you. The word means yearns. He craves you. So James goes from us craving our sins to God craving to draw us back in. He, he is passionate about you. Now look at verse 8. He said, here's what you can do and I can do because the Holy Spirit is at work in us. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. That's a great promise. He said, draw near right now. He'll manifest his presence in your life. He'll show up. He'll show up. He'll make himself known. I have seen over 35 years of walking with him, the closer I get to God, the closer I can walk with other people. You know, the temptation is to make other people be the ones that satisfy us and make us happy, but it never works. 
But if you walk close to God and he draws near to you and he makes his presence known, you can really genuinely walk with people. The closer I get to God, the more I can love people and walk closely to them. That's what changes our relationships. One more mark of humility as we finish. He said, I'll seek forgiveness and I'll repent. He said, I'll, I'll submit my life to God on a regular basis. He said, I'll stand up to Satan and the thoughts that come to me. I'll seek God's face. I'll seek him, not his stuff, not his blessings. I'll seek him. But then I'll seek forgiveness when I go wrong between God and other people, and I'll repent. I'll turn away from it. I won't just ask for forgiveness. I'll be willing to give my life to, to turn back around. That's what changes relationships. That's what makes them authentic. You know, the more we do the same sin, the more we hurt somebody in some way, what really evaporates is trust and intimacy and closeness. James is right on cue again. He says, verse 8, cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He's serious about it. Hands represents actions. It means as you go about your life, doing life, hands represents actions. Heart represents attitudes and affections. He says, deal with your behaviors but deal with your hard attitudes and affections. Deal with both of them. Tell people you're wrong. Tell people you were sorry. Tell people you did it. Tell God you did it. Say, I did it. I was wrong. He said, start making a way of life. Admit where you fall short. In this passage, he said, oh, that I wish you'd weep. I wish you'd weep over your sins. You remember Jesus when he came in Jerusalem when he was about to die? He wept. The word means uh, to double over to weep bitterly, not a few tears coming down. It's like when you weep and you've gotten a call in the middle of the night that somebody's not coming home. Or you weep over a marriage that's been broken. It's that kind of crying. He said, oh, I wish you'd cry at times. I, I wish you'd weep over what it does to God and to other people when you break faith, when you break trust, when there's a betrayal there. He said, oh, I wish you'd weep. But I said, I, I, he said, I wish you'd seek forgiveness too. And I wish you'd repent. I wish you'd ask the Lord to give you the courage to turn around. Again, hands means action. Hands means action. Heart means attitude. James 4.10. I want to remind you one more time. If you humble yourselves before the Lord, he'll exalt you. This is plural. So it, it's true individually. But it's true right now in your marriage. It's true right now with your children. It's true right now in your school, in your workplace. It's true in this church if we walk in humility, confidence in God during this time. If we walk in confidence, he'll exalt us. Oh, we may not become the biggest church in Erie by numbers, but he'll exalt us. I don't know, we might, but he'll exalt us. He'll show our testimony and our witness to people. We'll see people come to Christ. We'll see some of our children and grandchildren, our loved ones come to Christ Jesus We'll see a revival of some sort. He promises, you put your confidence in me and follow me. I will lift you up. I will exalt you. Maybe it starts right now with that prayer of surrender and with kneeling down. If you didn't kneel earlier, would you consider kneeling down before the Lord by yourself or with someone? Maybe in your C group this week, everybody would kneel down and submit your life to the Lord and pray for one another. In your D group, do the same. Say, Lord, here I am. I'm yours. Make it a way of life. You'll never regret submitting your life to God. You'll always regret submitting your life to someone else because they can only disappoint you. They can only discourage you. And in the end, Jesus said, there comes death. There comes death. Father, thank you. Thank you for reminding us to put your trust in your son whom you sent. Holy Spirit, give us the ability to submit all of our life to you so that you can fully do your work in us and through us to Erie and to beyond. In Jesus' name, amen.